And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Football Show on Off the Ball with Paddy Power. New normal, same old football. Paddy Power. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie. I'm prepared to edit the can. Well, do it then. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should there be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. All right, you're welcome along. It's Thursday's football show. Nathan with you for the next hour. We've got a busy show coming up because there's a lot going on. We're going to talk to Marcelo Moura Iaroco about the passing of Alejandro Sabella, the Argentinian football manager, which was, well, somewhat overshadowed by the passing of Diego Maradona. That's coming up in a little while. But Vinny Perth is with us as well on this evening's show. Good evening, Vinny. Good evening. How are you doing, Nathan? Love ah. the jumper. Thank you. I thought I'd make an effort. We've got a big charity initiative in aid of the Irish Cancer Society, Dare to Wear, taking place tomorrow. So please do get involved. Vinny, you should have had your Christmas jumper on. Come on, make an effort. I have it for tomorrow. I'll, I'll, I'll screenshot. I'll send do, it to you. Don't do, 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 do. We uh, get that up. What's the number we have to text? So we, give me the number of someone again. Give me the number before I give the wrong number. God damn, you're putting me on the spot, Vinny. We should have it up here in the studio. I'll give it out in just a minute. Right. Right. There is a, a lot going on at the moment. Uh, currently, it is Sheffield United 1. Manchester United too. United have turned this around because they went behind after five minutes and, well, it's one of these you couldn't make it up. Dean Henderson is in the side ahead of David De Gea. Five minutes in, they take a short free kick. They're playing it around at the back. It takes too long over the ball. Closed down by Sheffield United attacker and it's just past the Dave McGoldrick who taps into an empty net from five yards out. It is a disaster for Dean Henderson who's looked very nervous since then as well, Billy. Yeah, he, he, he hasn't. He's looked on edge, and it, it's a strange change to make with your goalkeeper. Um, Solskjaer has said it's for no other reason other than just he had pinpoint this game. Um, so it's a strange, strange change to make. And when you look at Manchester United, and it's been they've been getting away with it. It looks like they may get away with it tonight. But I think Andy Townsend uh, was on commentary that I was listening to, and he, he said like in the warm up, Sheffield United looked like they were at it. They looked like they had real determination in the warm-up and um, Manchester United just looked a little bit lethargic in the warm-up. So they haven't started the game well and, and they've been punished. And again, they find themselves behind and you won't get away with that for too long. But um, the front three are sensational when they do get going. So um, they've been a real threat tonight in the first half, that front three. Yeah, and it's two of them who have put them in front. Marcus Rashford, sensational finish, long ball forward from Victor Lindelof and the control and first-time shot shot was just right out of the top drawer and it's been a strange old season for Marcus Rashford because rightly getting so many plaudits off the field and tonight he's got a special award from FIFA as well after all his endeavours and his fight for those suffering from poverty and food deprivation in England. He's only scored three goals coming into this game, it's only his fourth Premier League goal of the season, he hasn't quite hit those heights that United probably expected coming in. It's been a big issue as much as the focus has been on the goalkeeper, the defence, Paul Pogba. Coming into the season, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer must have been so excited with what he saw in the last few months from Mason Greenwood, Marcus Rashford and Anthony Martial. And none of them have really done anything at all this season. No, I think when you add Martial into that tonight, I think that's his first goal in the Premiership or close enough mm. to it. Um, and both of them were at 19, 20 goals last season. So, uh, the goals have certainly dried up and um, I think they finished the season so well um, I think it was a false dawn I said at the time I think it, 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 we covered the um, it may have been the Christopher, uh, Aston Villa game where they were lucky at times I think the problem for Manchester United is clear if you ever want to sum it up I think the first 45 minutes sums it up the front three they, they had one counter attack with Fernandes and the front three Greenwood, Martial and Rashford and it was as good as you can see across Europe, across anywhere in the world, that counter-attack, the pace, the movement, um, the forward and force thing, it was, it was just brilliant, brilliant to watch. And for someone who likes that style of play, it, it got me off my seat, not being a Manchester United uh, fan, but he should have went 2-0 down. Uh, Fleck had the freedom at midfield at one stage. He's, he, um, they're, just, they're just tactically set up wrong. They, they seem to change a lot. Um throughout the season and um, it, it is difficult to pinpoint people. I think Pogba is being scapegoated in my opinion um, a little bit. Um, he hasn't helped himself of course but it, I think the structure of Manchester United in that midfield hasn't helped and um, it's putting a lot of pressure on the back four. It's putting a lot of 
pressure on the front guys to score goals. And remember, um, it's strange because if you win their game in hand and the result is where it is tonight, I think that I think they're second in the Premier Premier League. That's phenomenal. Mm. There is certainly problems in that club and problems in that team. So it could be another false dawn, but at the same time, results are results. If that was Jose Mourinho, um, he'd say we win our game in hand, we're second, and um, people would have to accept it. So it, it is a it is a strange place. It's very difficult to find out where Manchester United really are. And, and I think that's part of the problem. You don't know where where they are. You don't know what you're getting from Manchester United from one week to the next. Pogba is pulling out all the tricks at the moment. Five minutes gone in the second half. Sheffield United 1, Manchester United 2. And they're coming looking from a third. And they have a third. What a goal from Marcus Rashford. Paul Pogba did the full 360 in the middle of his own half. Lovely little ball forward. They broke at incredible speed and finished by Marcus Rashford. That is Manchester United at their very, very best. And after that very early setback, they're now in total control of this game. Marcus Rashford, second of the night for him. And it's now Sheffield United 1, Manchester United 3. And that was all down to the brilliance of Paul Pogba, who's probably having his best game in a long, long time in a Manchester United jersey. And I cannot wait. Actually, we're both going to be on commentary on Sunday for Manchester United against Leeds United at Old Trafford. It's our half four game. It promises, having watched and commentated on Leeds last night, to maybe be one of the games of the season. Well, again, it was like I, I teed it up. I think Pogba has been scapegoated. I think uh, it's, he's an easy target for some of the ex-professionals there. Um, but he, but he, also, he also doesn't deliver. No, he, he's been in and out of form, but so has the team. I think um, when a team is underperforming, they go after the big, the big names, the big players. But there's more to, more to that. He's had injuries over the last 18 uh, months. If, if Paul Pogba goes to Italy in January or Spain to one of the top clubs, we'll be looking back at him going, wow, what an amazing footballer. Wouldn't he be great? I mean, to sum up Manchester United for you, if you think about what Mourinho is doing at Spurs, and you forget he was ever at Manchester United, and Solskjaer lost his job, you would be saying, he's a real candidate for that job. When you look at someone like what Lukaku was doing for Inter Milan, you would say, forget he was ever at Manchester United. Imagine they had a striker like that, that, that uh, those front players could play off. It would be amazing. So some players have been, and people have been scapegoated in that club. There's bigger problems than just one or two individuals. Um, I think... United need two world-class fullbacks if they're going to play with that front three, for example. They need a world-class number six. Fred has done really well. McConney is the star of the future, I think. But they need world-class, three world-class players and probably two fullbacks and a number six. Um, so there's a lot to fix and it's it's not just all a Paul Pogba's door, in my opinion. I don't know if you saw Leeds last night and the 5-2 victory against Newcastle and John Giles was on earlier raving about them saying, listen, they're going to be inconsistent because they probably just don't have the quality of players you really need to play the system he wants. Where are you on Bielsa? He always comes across as the coach's coach. Is he someone whose methods you've studied? Yeah, I I actually have, uh, in in my downtime, I've done some study on, on Bielsa. I've managed to get some footage uh, through a friend of mine up behind the goals to see what they do and uh, massive learning how they go man on man against people um, and we all have our own little WhatsApp groups and uh, discussion points and I've been discussing Bielsa there last week in terms of uh, I, I feel he's been getting away with murder in one sense because uh, the results on the pitch haven't been that good they've been quite lucky that a lot of, like the likes of Sheffield United the bottom of the league the three or four places off relegation and then they go out and put that performance in last night against Newcastle which at times was sensational um, so uh, Pochettino and uh, Pep Guardiola can't be wrong about the man he has to be a genius but he's certainly got a fair bit of leeway at Leeds in terms of uh, some of the results you know giving out the team he's going to play before games and stuff like that has backfired on him a little bit um, he, he's a genius uh, there's no doubt about it. You have to take the word of Pochettino and, and Pep, but I'm still on the fence. I'm waiting to see him uh, deliver with this Leeds team. Uh, my father, who's a Leeds fan all his life, said to me, well, he hasn't got the players and yet to, to implement the style. And that's probably a fair enough. And Don Joel said something similar. That's probably a fair reflection. Leeds need to, to back him over time. And uh, maybe in a year or two time, 
uh, there'll be no argument. He will be a genius and he'll take them up into the next level. But I'm on the fence at the moment. Uh, but I love what he's doing. It's fascinating to watch it from, from a distance. Yeah, so Manchester United, Leeds United coming your way on Sunday. It is Manchester United 3, Sheffield United 1 at Bramall Lane. Ten minutes gone in the second half. A uh, few bits and pieces going on today. Alan Manis, the Shamrock Rovers goalkeeper, uh, named as SSE Artricity Goalkeeper of the Year at the Soccer Writers Association Awards. Robert Lewandowski has managed to squeeze out Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo to be named Player of the Year, Men's Player of the Year at the Best FIFA Football Awards in Zurich. 55 goals in 47 games. You still always feel, Vinny, that Messi Ronaldo's always going to get the vote. But I'm told uh, apparently Stephen Kenny and Seamus Coleman both voted for Robert Lewandowski. And he is the winner. And you'd have to say a deserved yeah, winner. It's a strange one for me where Mane is not in that list. I understand Salah's form dipped a little bit in terms of the number of goals he scored. But Mane not being... Um, there, thereabouts. I think. I think if you were asking a top top coach, who would you rather in your side today or in the last twelve months? I think you'd rather Mane than than probably Messi. As much as that would uh, upset a few people, Mane's form should, he should be there, thereabouts in the top three. I would say. The Manchester City defender Lucy Bronze won the Best Women's Player Award. Jurgen Klopp won the Best Coach Award for the second successive year. He beat off uh, Hansi Flick, obviously Bayern Munich won the Champions League and Marcelo Bielsa somehow was in the final three. Uh, well, the standard is so high of mm. Bielsa being listed at that. That's why I'm questioning it. But at the same time, he's obviously, he is a genius. There's no doubt about it. But let's see, can he back it up on the pitch a little bit more? Uh, Young Men's Son won the Puskas Award. I'm sorry, that goal against Burnley was the most overrated goal. I couldn't even believe it got goal of the season in the Premier League. It's fine. He shows a lot of pace. He runs straight through the middle. I think he gets around two players. It's not exactly Maradona against England, yet somehow Young Min's son has won the Puskas Award. So that's the... Torres, which I'm still a bit bitter about because <laughs> that was something we worked on the training ground. Um, and before... Ah, anyone... come on, Vinny. You can't claim credit for that. Well, before anyone uh, tries to give me, uh, think I'm taking credit for it, it was designed for Jordan to go around the back. Um, all the players go to the front post and he heads it in from six, seven yards. Uh, it was certainly not to do something what he did, which was pretty amazing, to be fair to him. We'll talk about Dundalk and Shamrock Rovers uh, in a moment, but uh, news tonight that Kevin Sheedy is the new manager of Waterford. I've been picked up on calling them Waterford United. Of course, they changed the name a couple of years back. So Kevin Sheedy, it's his first managerial job for the Irish footballing legend, and he's going to be assisted by Mike Newell at Waterford. So again, it's sort of out of the blue from a Waterford point of view, but it seems that... That's what the chairman does down there. Yeah, it's completely out of blue. It's fascinating. It's only broken the last couple of minutes, so I'm, I'm quite surprised. But I think Mike, I think Kevin Sheedy had worked underage level at a couple of clubs, so um, he has been coaching away. Mike Newell has has definitely coached uh, some League One, um, League Two clubs. So um, it, it is a strange one. I think I think it's a good appointment that. Um, in the sense of the glamour around it, I just hope that it's not a trophy appointment, that he back it up with some serious signings and um, he put Lee Power puts his money where his mouth is and, and backs these guys because Lee Varner needs a shot in the arm. It's been a difficult 12 months for it, so I'm just hoping that um, these guys are here for the real and this is a serious appointment. Well, you had a great relationship with the last Wat Waterford manager. Yeah, I did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Yourself and John Sheridan? Yeah, he's a good good man. He's doing well for himself at the moment, I see. <laughs> uh, like, where are you at the moment then? Like, are you in for a job like Waterford? Are you looking abroad? Are you, are you eyeing up something back in the League of Ireland? You've had a little bit of time. You've had a couple of months to yourself. What is the plan? Um, I've, I've done the garden, the front, the back, the neighbour's garden, the top of the road. All of that is sorted now. So um, now I've got itchy feet. Um, League of Ireland is not a target of mine over the next sort of couple of months, the next six, seven months, unless something c comes available. I haven't actively, there isn't jobs there as such, um, so I haven't actively been been chasing, been chasing jobs. Um, I have spoke to clubs in England. I've um, I've been interviewed for a couple of jobs in League One, League Two over the last three or four weeks. Right. Um, great experience. Loved it. I've spoken to a club in Norway. Uh, and, um, and a, a club in America, nothing has come there. But 
I've, I've spoken to things, uh, different clubs outside of Ireland. I feel that um, while I love League of Ireland, I feel that maybe uh, I should look and see is there a chance I can progress my, my career, my sort of knowledge of the game by, by moving outside of the country. If that comes about, and that's what I'm chasing at the moment, if that comes available, great. Uh, but listen, I could be, in a couple of months' time, I could be back working like everyone else, going to a nine-to-five job. So it, it's sort of up in the air at the moment and nothing is set in stone as we as we speak. But I am actively now looking for work, thankfully. Have you got any sense from those interviews around League One, League Two as to what sort of stock those clubs put in having a Ertricity League Premier Division title on your CV? Uh, it's difficult. It's difficult. The pe people in England don't respect uh, Irish football to the same extent as uh, as we do. Um, there's no doubt about that. It's difficult. Um, you know, the fact that you have Champions League, Europe, Europa League experience, it's not the same weight. Uh, so it makes it difficult for, for, for people. Um, I suppose some of the advantages of being some of our players in the last sort of 10 years have moved over. It is more on the radar than it was maybe 10 years ago. But it is difficult as a manager. German uh, clubs in League 1, League 2 don't know too much about Dundalk or, or Irish football. It's not a window to shop in. Um, and interestingly, uh, clubs outside of, of, of the UK that I have spoken to or, or, or when jobs have come up, I've approached them. Um, certainly know more about Dundalk and Irish football than, than clubs in England. So it is difficult, but... Um, it's interesting. It's um, it's part of, of my learning experience doing these interviews and mm. um, learning from them, and it's 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 been quite good. I've enjoyed it, to be honest with you. Like we see, say in the Premier League this week, Sam Allardyce gets another gig to come in in place of Slaven Village, and it feels like a bit of an old school appointment. When you're at these clubs, does it feel still quite old school? Of it's a more who you know than what you know. Or is it more that modern style of football that even like sure it's nearly a decade ago now when Brendan Rodgers rocks up to Liverpool and he's got this 180 page dossier of what he wants to do with the team and the club like are you having to come with that sort of preparation? Uh, yes, you have to. Um, so um, I've, I've been speaking to a club in England over the last couple of days and I've had to produce a document for them. Um, I, I I didn't I wasn't in in for the job, but. The, Take the job in Barnet, for argument's sake, um, in the conference. Big club, or certainly a big club when we compare it to Irish clubs. They're in the conference. They've just hired Tim Flowers. Um, Tim Flowers obviously played with England and won a, a, a premiership. So the caliber of people looking for jobs, Shrewsbury appointed Steve Cottrell. Um, there's a lot of big names getting big jobs uh, in England at the lower level. So... You're competing against really big names, so you've got to do something different. And that's, that's sort of part of my process, why I apply for a job. Even if deep down I know I'm probably not going to get it, uh, you still apply for it, so you go through the process and you learn from what you're, what the feedback is like. Some clubs are good, they give you feedback, other clubs you know, would tell you nothing more than we've, we, we've 80 CVs in and yours is one of 80, so you've mm. got to be different to, to be different, you know? So much has spoken about Stephen Kenny's success and what he was able to do and then make that step up to the Ireland job. It is such an outlier, though, for League of Ireland managers. You look at somebody like John Caulfield, the success he had at Cork City, ends yeah. up spending a lot of time out of the game and ends up going back to Galway and taking over a team in the first division. You look at other managers, Tim Clancy and Drott, who's working a full-time job through the night while also managing the team. It's, it's not... It's certainly not the Stephen Kenny lifestyle for most managers. No, I think what Stephen done is once in a lifetime. I know Brian Kerr done it as well, to be fair, but that was slightly different because he had so much success with the mm. underage. So um, I, I'm not sure if, even if I was still at Dundalk and we won the league for the next five years and a couple of Europa leagues, etc., real success, would the next manager be appointed with Ireland? I think, I think that's probably... Stephen worked so hard, he got he got that little bit of luck to be given the job and he uh, hopefully he takes that uh, opportunity. So um, managers and coaches in Ireland are like players. Um, we need, we, yes, we, we, we love our league. It gives us a huge opportunity. I felt Dundalk was the right club for me. I, was, I felt it was a club I could build a, 
um, a bigger long-term club. I, I felt we could be like a Bate Barca or a Basel or one of these clubs, European clubs. Uh, it wasn't to be. Uh, so I probably need to, to move outside of Ireland. But at the same time, who, as I said, who knows? I could be I could be going back to my route and, and managing Sacred Heart in the Leinster Senior League next week or six weeks' time. Or I could be coaching in Norway, Denmark, America. So... Uh, it is difficult for our managers. Um, there isn't a, an industry here for players or managers or coaches, and that's just the, the harsh reality of it. Well, look, if you want to keep your eye in, you're always welcome at the under eights in Parkvale if you just want to give a little few tips. Now, the standard of coaching already very high, Vinny, so, you know, bring your A game if you're coming up. Look forward to it, look forward to it. Uh, Sheffield United 1, Manchester United 3, 20 minutes gone in the second half. So it's been a very interesting few days in the League of Ireland, and particularly around your old club, Dundalk. We have seen a bit of an exodus. We've seen Jim McGilton come in as a director of football. But Sean Gannon and Sean Hoare going to the champion, Shamrock Rovers, who finished 22 points ahead of Dundalk, is a surprise in one way, but maybe not in everything that's gone on in Dundalk in the past six months to a year. Looks as though John Mountain is going to St. Patrick's Athletic. Gary Rogers has retired. How do you feel now, looking on from the outside, that this team that Stephen Kenny and yourself built up over five, six years is starting to be broken up. Um, it was nice of you to mention Stephen Kenny and myself. I was there for them eight years. Um, some people would like, or do forget that sometimes. No, on a serious note, um, I felt that um, the cup final was a, was a big lesson. Uh, I, I fancied Dundalk in the cup final. I fancied them win the game. I spoke to a few, few people before it. Um, one, they were playing at a high level in Europe, so that meant it's, it was difficult for Rovers. But the big, the big thing about the cup final, and whether they, they, I would, I would say they've seen it, and you must give huge credit to Shamrock Rovers. The cup final swung from the bench. Um, young Dean Williams, who looks like a, he is going to be a good player, he had uh, Reese Marshall and Greg Bulger, who had really struggled because of that injury and was just about getting back. They were sort of three changes Rovers made. Dundalk were able to bring on Daniel Kelly. Jordan Flores came on and probably changed the cup final for them. And uh, Sean Hoare, who scored ultimately. Um, Dundalk's bench and the strength and depth they had won them the cup final. Um, obviously, the manager made good changes at the right time as well, to be fair to him. Rovers have learned from that. Um, and they've gone and said, Roy, we, we're not as far ahead as that 22 points would tell you because... Rightly or wrongly, Dundalk didn't compete for the league once they felt they were out of it. So they've learned from it. I mean, it's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking for me to see Sean Gannon in a, a Shamrock Rovers jersey in particular. It was Sean Hoare, but Sean Gannon and everything we built at that club. Um, but at the same time, I completely understand why he's there. Um, I understand all the rationale behind Sean's thinking. And ultimately... It looks like a really good move for him. It looks like he's going to a club that are doing all the right things on and off the pitch. And it looks like success will continue. For Sean, he's the most decorated footballer, probably in Irish football, uh, six stroke seven league titles and, and numerous other stuff. So um, it's, it, it is it's a great bit of business by Shamrock Rovers and they've learned uh, and they haven't stood still and they've improved their squad. And I think ultimately they've really hurt Dundalk because the pace of Gannon and Hall taking that away from Dundalk will really hurt them and it's a big job to fix that. I'm sure matters on the pitch is one of the driving forces for both Gannon and Hoare because Shamrock Rovers, you say, are doing so much right and will be strong, strong favourites to win the title again and to go and try and compete in Europe. But matters off the pitch and contract wrangling and it seems Dundalk having had a complete shift in attitude as to the sort of contracts they wanted to hand out that there's no more three-year deals. It's a, a one-year contract with the club then having control over way, whether they stay another year. Like, is this something that you saw coming down the line from Dundalk, that there was going to be this, what seems a pretty dramatic change, considering the money that has come into the club in the last few years? Yeah, I suppose. Um, I haven't. I, I think I've done one brief interview since I've left Dundalk, and partially because I care too much about the players and where they want to be where on the pitch. But one thing I did say uh, the night after when I was interviewed, I said there was a difference of opinion. The board wanted to go one way and I wanted to go, I felt the club should go a different way. Um, Duffy, Gannon, Hoare, 
were all players that were discussed uh, back in April, May, June. They were players that needed to be tied to Dundalk. Um, they were probably my three targets at the current squad. Yes, there was rebuilding needed in the squad, but we felt that that has to be done gradually. You can't just bring in seven, eight new players. Um, but one-year contracts, like like Sean Gannon um, is someone who probably... The one thing I learned, I, I learned a big lesson um, when it came to signing players and want to get the players to your club. And people say it's about money. It's not about money for Sean Gannon. I don't believe he's on any more money at Shamrock Rovers than he is at Dundalk. He's got longevity in a in a contract, but um, I remember in 2014, I think it was that year. Uh, I was talking to Stephen Kenny on the phone, and I was annoying him like all oh, good assistant manager, saying, "Have you signed Daryl Horgan yet? Is he in? What's the story?" No, no, no. Give me a minute. Give me time. He was heading to a wedding that day. It was actually ironically Rory Higgins' wedding up in Derry. He left his wife at that wedding because his, his mind was frazzled. He drove to Galway, signed Daryl Horgan, insisted Daryl signed, and went back to the wedding. Um, players like Sean Gannon, Sean Hoare, Michael Duffy need that love and attention and need to be dragged, kicking and screaming to your club. Uh, they need to believe in the manager. And I think that's what Rovers have done with the two players from speaking to them briefly. Um, they feel part of the group and part of feel wanted. And that's what a two-year deal and other things uh, give you. I suppose you got to tour the stadium, tour the training ground, all of that stuff as well. And that's played a big part in it. And, yeah. uh, and look, the personal touch is obviously important in these issues, but the contract, I guess, for players of that age profile is also huge. So what, aside from money saving, do you think is, is the thought process behind just offering one-year deals? Like when you think back to your preparations for last season and the players that you were bringing in, Patching, Kolovic, players like this. Hey, you weren't offering them one-year contracts, were you? No, we didn't. Um, both both Patching and Kolovic are on two-year deals. Um, I think, and, and the Torje is a, an option for the club, and that would be that would be standard and normal. Um, th there was a change in the club. They they can um, listen. It's not for me. I don't know the inner workings over the last couple of months, but we like. Jim Magilton has gone in. I think that's mm. a really good appointment and I would have been, actually, that would be, uh, it'd be safe to say that I would have suggested somebody like Jim and that sort of, his name would have came from someone like me when I was at the club. I felt the club needed someone like that. But he's on a four-year deal. But it made a, a, a that's a long-term commitment within football. And then to commit one year with players, um, that's not building, that's not, getting them to buy in, mm. that's the personal touch. So that confuses me a little bit. So um, Dundalk, the, all of the staff, Jim has mentioned that there's players everywhere if you really want them. But I don't think that works. Um, I think it takes time. We did it last year. We, we slowly, the squad was getting older. People have been critical of the recruitment at Dundalk, but if you actually analyse it, when last year we lost the cup final because Shields and McElhenney was injured. Mm. We struggled in Europe because Duffy's wife had a baby and he wasn't there. And we made all them changes. And when you look at this year in Europe, when, when Hoobham was injured, Macmillan scored a big goal in Europe. When Patrick McElhenney wasn't there, Sean Murray scored some big goals. When, in the playoff game, when Shields wasn't there, Slugger played as the number six and was exceptional. So, so you don't think it is a case of, because obviously there's been a lot of changes behind the scenes and Bill Holtzizer is a far greater role in the club that it, it, because of maybe his limited understanding of the game that he's looking at last year going well, like even those two players that we talk about, Patching and Kolovic, so we've gone, we've invested in them, it hasn't really worked out for them, but now we're stuck with them for another year because we've signed this long-term contract that actually, well maybe we're better off just getting players in for a year if it works out great, we might add to it, but that they... They've been, he feels a little bit stung and feels maybe there's a different way of doing it. Yeah, and, and that's where the difference lies. But I don't think someone like Patching, like maybe me and maybe Rory Higgins are wrong about Will Patching. Um, we, we believe he's... You don't just come into Ireland and just hit the ground running. So many players have taken time. You look at Jamie McGrath now when we signed him from Pats and you look where he is now, it, it's a slow process in building. But I suppose that's where the difference is uh, in opinion. 
Um, I believe you should you should build from a, a position of strength. We and that's where you bring your Kolovich, your patchings into your squad. Uh, if you if you if you just even think of last night's game, one of the biggest games in world football. Liverpool are playing Williams and Curtis Jones in the middle of it the, because they're building from a, a, a position of strength. Manchester United can't do that at the moment because they're not in a strength, strong position. They used to do it for years. Dundalk were in a position of strength to bring in people. Nobody gets recruitment 100% right. Players don't settle, foreign players don't. But um, th- there was a plan in place last January, February to bring players into the squad from outside of Ireland because there is limited amount of quality there. There's a lot of quality players, but there's, mm. there isn't that amount. And if you want to be competitive in Europe, you've got to do something different. We must learn from, as I said, someone like Basel in Switzerland, um, Bate Borisov, um, Salzburg, Austria, Switzerland and, and Belarus. The hardly big soccer nations. I know Switzerland are highly ranked with the national team, but the league and, and we needed to learn from them. We need an influx of of players from outside of Ireland to make us better. With that, there's a little bit of risk. It feels so, like that's gone in Dundalk, though, unfortunately. It feels like that opportunity that was there. And listen, maybe these are still teething problems at the early stage of what's going to be a long-term relationship between Peak Six and Dundalk. But like, I'm sure Dundalk fans are pretty concerned looking at this because we know the history of League of Ireland. We know the history of League of Ireland clubs as how many of them struggle financially where just you're on the cusp of something, an investor pulls out. Like, have you... Have you, now that you're removed from it somewhat, have you any sense of what the short-term, medium-term plan is for Peak Six in terms of what they want to do with the club? Um, uh, listen, I think Peak Six are good people. I think their heart is in the right place. Um, I'll put that on record. But I'm confused, like any other fan. Um, One-year contract followed by a four-year um, contract for the boss, the new boss. There's only one boss in Dundalk, but a new four-year deal. That confuses me, so I'm not 100% sure what, what the future is. Um, like, I don't know the contract talks that are going on with players out of contract, but if you continue to, to, to leak the amount of players out of that squad, high-quality players, then you're not going to be back in Europe. Um, teams, will, teams will come after you. So it's concerning. Uh, I don't know what the what the, the thinking is. I don't think Peak Six are the type of people who will just walk away and, and leave Dundalk high and dry. I do believe they're good people. But um, the sense of of it leaves me with question marks. And I'm like any other Dundalk fan. I don't I don't understand the logic of of Gannon Hoare and people being able to leave to go to your main rivals and, and, and strengthen them and strengthen them because the cup final proved me right. I don't think the gap was that big between the two sides. Forget the league positions. It was a strange year, COVID, etc. Dundalk, Dundalk let Shamrock Rovers walk into the ground and win 4-0. That's, yeah. just, that's just crazy. So um, there, is, there, there is reason to be concerned, but I don't see the club folding or, 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 or being able to unpay bills. I'm just not sure they're taking the right direction. Um, I wasn't sure that back in the summer, and that's partly why I, I, myself and the club decided enough was enough. So it doesn't look it doesn't look good for me. I'm concerned, uh, but it's up to Jim uh, Magilton to turn it around, and and he needs to be a very very strong character in that club because yeah. uh, where they are now is, is, is deeply concerning for for a Dundalk fan. And even more so when you look at what Shamrock Rovers are doing strengthening from that position of strength. So they've got Gannon, they've got Hoare, they've brought Danny Mandrew in as well, who's obviously maybe had a difficult enough time recently with Bohemians, but unquestionable potential there for Danny Mandrew. And also now maybe a ready-made replacement for Jack Byrne. It feels we should know maybe over the weekend what Jack Byrne's plans are. Yeah, I think uh, Danny Mandrew is, is someone I spoke to. I, I didn't speak, I spoke, not him directly, he was under contract. I spoke to his agent um, early on in the year. He was someone that I would have liked him to do business with. Um, he's someone I feel that Dundalk would improve Dundalk. Um, again, the challenge was I could only offer him a one-year deal. Or that's all the club was offering at that time. Um, so that wasn't good. But Danny Mandrew is... The, the, the challenge you have in the league is if you're Dundalk, 
sitting there today, who do you sign that's unattached today to make you better? And the two players that spring to mind is Danny Mandrew up until this week and um, Danny Grant. And it looks like Grant will go to uh, Huddersfield in the UK. And that's the challenge Irish football has now. So much of our talent is leaving. Um, when you look at what Jamie McGrath is doing, that's, that, they see that as a better road than going down the League of Ireland route um, after a couple of years. So it, it, Rovers have done brilliant business. Um, whether whether it's a result of the cup final or not, I don't know. But lessons had to be learned out of losing that cup final, and they certainly done it. And um, Danny Mandrew, for me, uh, has the ability to to be as good as Jack Bourne. Right. Um, so, what for whatever reason he didn't fit the style of play yeah. of Bowles and and his work rate, they questioned at different stages. But he is a he is a, a future star in League of Ireland and. Um, we get a no better place than Palestinian to showcase his, his talents. Finny, great stuff as always. There's a lot in that. There's plenty to come back to as well, I think, about that path for Irish players and the path for the League of Ireland in terms of players from abroad that we'll certainly come back to over the coming months. I wish you the very best with these job interviews. Not before Sunday, though, because you are going to be on cold commentary for us for Manchester yeah. United and Leeds United, so write that into the contract. And will, you still be at, will you still do cold commentary if Dublin trash Mayo on Saturday? Well, listen, what? I would be more worried, Vinny, about what happens if Mayo win and whether or not I'll be there on Sunday. So I think okay. that's that's the more pressing concern right now. Stephen on standby, so. <laughs> exactly, do. All right, great stuff, Vinny. Uh, we're going to take a very quick break. Still Sheffield United 1, Manchester United 3. Football on Off The Ball With Paddy Power New normal, same old football Paddy Power Gamble responsibly, gamblingcare.ie This Friday, News Talk will wear to care Will you? We're asking you to show you care with what you wear so that together we can raise vital funds for cancer patients and their families by making a donation to the Irish Cancer Society. All you have to do is don your favourite festive fashions, whether it's a Christmas jumper, Santa hat or even your cosy Christmas PJs. There's just one rule. If you dress up, you donate. Wear to Care, in aid of the Irish Cancer Society. This Friday on News Talk. They said it couldn't be done. A marketing tool so immediate, your message can reach the nation at the speed of sound. Okay, look, it's radio. Yes, radio. And because it's so simple to make, you can write your brilliant ad today, record it in the morning, Take one. and be on air by tea time. And don't worry, <clears throat> you can still sound fancy. Notions. Radio. We let people know your business. Find out more at newstalk.com slash advertising. Follow the leader, the Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV, the world's best-selling plug-in hybrid, is now available with 0% finance and a free home charge point worth €800. Euro. Leading the charge in plug-in hybrid technology, the Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV. Book a test drive at your local dealer today. Mitsubishi. Drive your ambition. Terms and conditions apply. See Mitsubishi Motors.ie. Lending criteria applies. This is a hard purchase agreement provided by Bank of Ireland Finance. For live GAA score updates, stats, and more as they happen, check out the new GAA Live Match Centre on the Boyle Sports app. Why not check out the hottest action on the biggest match of the week right now and make Boyle Sports number one for GAA this championship season? Boyle Sports. This is betting. Need help? Contact gamblingcare.ie. 18 plus. As an aspiring business leader, your time is at a premium. But don't let that stop you advancing your career. With only two days attendance required each month, the new Modular Executive MBA from UCD Smurfett School is the flexible choice for those with busy professional and personal schedules. Unlock your leadership potential with one of the world's leading business schools. It's your future on your terms. Learn more today at smurfettschool.ie. UCD Michael Smurfett Graduate Business School. Developing impactful business leaders. At Experts Electrical Stores, LG OLED TVs bring you more. More pixels, over 8.3 million. They add up to make LG OLED TVs richer, sharper, and smoother. Now they're bringing more boom to your room. Get a free LG speaker with every LG OLED TV at Experts Electrical Stores nationwide or at expert.ie. Blocked nose, sore throat, headache. 
the symptoms of a cold or flu can really knock the stuffing out of you. So it's good to know that Nurofen Cold and Flu has the power to relieve those aches and pains for up to eight hours. Nurofen Cold and Flu contains an anti-inflammatory and a decongestant, which should help you bounce back. Nurofen Cold and Flu, for effective relief of cold and flu symptoms. Nurofen Cold and Flu film-coated tablets contain ibuprofen and pseudofedrine hydrochloride. Always read the label. Eight-hour relief refers to ibuprofen. Hi, everyone. Eamon Coughlin here. The Gold Mile has been running for nearly 40 years. This year, it's different, but we're not stopping. The Goal Mile has gone virtual, so we need you to sign up online to walk or run your own Goal Mile this Christmas. Register today at goldmile.org and keep the Goal Mile running for those who need it the most. Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie Still Sheffield United 1, Manchester United 3, 5 minutes remaining in that game in the Premier League. But let's go to Argentina to talk to Marcela Mora Iaroco. Good evening, Marcela. Hello, good evening. How are you? I'm very well. Last time we spoke to you was just in the hours after the passing of Diego Maradona and we saw obviously the huge outpouring of grief around Argentina. In the last couple of weeks since Maradona's passing, what sort of tributes are being paid? What are the plans to remember Maradona in his native country? Well, as with uh, his life, his uh, death has left a ton of possible uh, bestsellers and box sets of thrillers and all manner of uh, drama. So um, there is talk that his last wish had been to be embalmed. There is talk of uh, having to dig up the body to check the DNA for some uh, people who think he may have been his father. There's a quite strong litigation about the estate and the possible allocation of rights over his brand, the Maradona brand, between the last agent that worked with him or lawyer and people involved in the past. And there is also a, a very serious investigation into possible medical negligence or malpractice regarding the last few uh, days and certainly hours of his life. So it's uh, from almost every angle imaginable, it's uh, been high on the news agenda. Mm. And I don't think we could have expected any less. In fact, I'm sitting right now with uh, his biographer, Daniel Arcucci, who is regarded as the man who knows him best, knew him best, possibly in the world, certainly among us journalists, and mm. we were just uh, having a little personal chat about what what he's left us with and his legacy. And I, I hasten to add, I'm still, he's still giving us work, so, mm. you know, thanks, Diego. Yeah, it certainly doesn't sound like he's going to be able to rest in peace, certainly not for the foreseeable future. Not for the foreseeable future, for sure. And, uh, and, and, it's, uh, and I th if I could just add, um, there's also a very interesting set of conversations going on uh, in the media, personally, intragenerational, gender. Uh, you know, there's feminists decrying the people who support him. And then there's a movement called Fem Maradonian Feminists who defend him. There's a political angle, the class angle generations, there's younger kids saying, why are you lot so unhappy or miserable? Why did you like him so much? And there's younger kids who love football, who adored him. It's a really interesting time and the, uh, among the ton, an absolute ton of uh, articles and TV specials and uh, podcasts and so on that have come out. There's been some incredible good quality uh, social narrative. Mm. I mean, outstanding. It's it's really, really interesting. I think as complicated as he was in life and as difficult to say he was this or he was that or he was a cheat or he was a genius or he was a drug addict or he was a a, a great political strategist. You know, he, he was a nuanced man and he was permanently everything, like a Mobius strip. He, like he showed you two sides or three sides of everything. And it continues to be like that. And I, and I think it's a really interesting time politically, socially, you know, the pandemic. It's a strange point in history. Mm. Someone said to me this morning, maybe his death really is the end of the uh, 20th century, you know, the, the long century, and it's marking something, a, a beginning of a new time or something. 
um, we're all quite, you know, passionate and, and like to believe in these things yeah. in the Southern Hemisphere. We, we obviously spent several days paying tribute to Maradona and talking about the depth of the story, but from what you're saying, I think early in the new year, we need to come back and talk to you again and maybe spend an hour going through some of those storylines you're talking about. And <laughs> it probably actually sums yeah. up tonight because we got you on to talk about the death of Alejandro Sabella, whose death sadly was overshadowed by Maradona. And here we are again, spending half the conversation talking about Diego Maradona, but, but how could you not? Uh, talk about Sabella then, because he died at a very young age of 66. He was the man who brought Argentina to the World Cup final in 2014. The one manager at international level who, who seemed to get the best out of Lionel Messi. And of course, he was a player who came to England because Sheffield United couldn't afford to sign Diego Maradona at the time. Can you talk a little bit That's about right. him and what sort of figure he was? Well, I think, I mean, his death is probably overshadowed in terms of media coverage, but, but he was definitely mourned very respectfully and very publicly. He, he's a, a huge loss and he was a very respected and, and very well-liked man, um, Sabella. And uh, you mentioned the 2014 World Cup, which is po possibly his greatest achievement and, and slightly unexpected, I guess. Um, but during that World Cup, I think his own uh, strategy and his own uh, view of the game lasted possibly 45 minutes at the beginning of the World Cup. And then at that first half time, the players said, mm, we're not going to do this, we're going to play another way. And perhaps what, what he was good at doing that World Cup was letting them play the way they wanted. I mean, right. there was talk at the time that there was some tension, but I think there wasn't really as much tension as all that. And he was... Uh, I mean, I, I wrote during the World Cup that you could see him shrinking as the tournament advanced. Right. But he he was a very um, he was a very interesting figure. He was low profile. He was politically outspoken, um, which isn't that common here for, for football figures. I mean, some are, but not all. He always was kind of second to someone. I mean, you mentioned, mentioned that he went to Sheffield because they couldn't afford Maradona, but he was also Passarella's. Uh, assistant in, in as a as a coach and um you know he was always he 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 took estudiantes to a great title after a long period of not winning anything but that was really also in the kind of shadow of veron taking over the club as, right. as a superstar so he's always kind of doing the legwork where where someone else is the the superstar or the big name um but but, but a huge loss and he had been unwell for for a long time so again it, it's not entirely a surprise or an unexpected death but the, the the you know the people who have been an important part of our football history and our football life are leaving us at alarming rate one could say and um yes it, 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 he, he was mourned again very eloquently and with a lot of respect from all corners of the football community yes. here he, unfortunately, we're very short in time, but reading up on him, he, he came from a very different background to Diego Maradona, quite a wealthy background, but had an incredible social conscience as well. Yes, I think he was an educated uh, uh, left winger. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, this morning we were talking about trying to place football men in left or right and authoritarian and liberal playing with this quadrant that, that's going round and trying to place them all in various places. I think Sabella would probably be a, a, a left libertarian somehow. He was... Um, but, but again, it was interesting because, for example, he only gave interviews to a couple of newspapers here that were cooperative and, you know, had uh, quite clear political alignments towards the left and, and he would call them in first and so on. But then if they criticised him or if the, the football line they took was something he didn't agree with, he was quite happy to say, no, look, yeah. why do you say this? Or I didn't play that. So, you know, a, a nice educated guy with a social conscience and also a, a professional approach to football and tactics. All right, Marcel, unfortunately, we're very tight on time. We'll definitely come back to you early in 2021, uh, when we're starting the new century, as you put it. Um, but thanks a lot for taking the time out to remember Alejandro Sabella this evening. Thank you, thank you. Marcelo Mora, Iroko. Uh, Sheffield United 2, Manchester United 3 in the final minute of injury time. Sheffield United almost equalised. We'll take a quick break and bring you the full time.
Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. New normal, same old football. Paddy Power. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie Whether the Christmas Day family video call happens across different counties or across three global time zones, at Vodafone, we know Christmas traditions are all about connecting. Feel the joy of unlimited connection this year with Vodafone Pay As You Go. Enjoy unlimited data and 50 euro off the Samsung Galaxy A21s and the Samsung Galaxy A41, all on Ireland's best performing mobile network. Switch to Vodafone Pay As You Go in store today. Terms apply, see Vodafone.ie. 20 euro top up required. Offer ends January 5th, 2021. Follow the leader, the Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV, the world's best-selling plug-in hybrid, is now available with 0% finance and a free home charge point worth €800. Euro. Leading the charge in plug-in hybrid technology, the Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV. Book a test drive at your local dealer today. Mitsubishi, drive your ambition. Terms and conditions apply. See Mitsubishi Motors.ie. Lending criteria applies. This is a hire purchase agreement provided by Bank of Ireland Finance. This Christmas, give the gift of books from Eason with wonderful children's books like J.K. Rowling's enthralling Ichabog, David Walliams' hilarious codename Bananas, the brand new Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Cat Kid Comic Club from Dave Pilkey, and Zoe Suggs' Magpie Society YA novel. All carefully chosen by us for you. Because this Christmas means more. When heartburn and indigestion hit, take Gaviscon's Extra Dual Air Tablet. It works fast, and it's longer lasting than antacids for up to four hours relief. Bat heartburn and indigestion away with Gaviscon Extra Chewable Tablet. Gaviscon Extra Chewable Tablets contain sodium alginate, sodium bicarbonate and calcium carbonate for heartburn and indigestion. Always read the label. It's Paddy's week-long session on the Paddy Power App. So we'll have all those things that Irish people love at a session. Like, you know, shamrocks and kilts and Kaylee dancing and... Nah, only cotton you. It's less diddly eye and more what we're really about. Quality sport and unbelievable generosity. A monster eight-day rollover of specials exclusively for our customers in Ireland from December 12th to the 19th. Log on to our website or open our app to find out more. Paddy Power, 18 plus, gamblingcare.ie. Hi everyone, Eamon Coughlin here. The Gold Mile has been running for nearly 40 years. This year, it's different, but we're not stopping. The Goal Mile has gone virtual, so we need you to sign up online to walk or run your own Goal Mile this Christmas. Register today at goldmile.org and keep the Goal Mile running for those who need it the most. Don't miss the O'Brien's Christmas Wine Sale with over 200 wines from independent family wineries to well-known brands like Half Price, Monte Real Rioja, Gran Reserva, now only $16.70 or Champagne Tattinger Brut Reserve, now $39.95. Save €21. Euro. Pop in store. Please enjoy alcohol sensibly. Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. Minimal contact in stadiums? Shouldn't stop the usual suspects from going down. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie A brace from Marcus Rashford has helped Manchester United make it 10 away wins in a row in the Premier League. They've beaten Sheffield United 3-2. Dave McGoldrick with a couple of goals for Sheffield United. Dean Henderson, terrible mistake at the start. Brilliant save right at the end to give United the victory. Tomorrow morning on OTB AM from half seven, Andy Mitten on that match. Clean O'Connor on the men's and ladies All-Ireland Football Finals. Alan Quinlan ahead of another weekend of Champions Cup. We have live commentary of Munster's trip to Claremont O'Verne on Saturdays off the ball. Then tomorrow night, we're bringing you three fine Mayo men. Stephen Rochford, Barry Morning, Kevin Kilban talking about All-Ireland Football Finals past and the one coming up this Saturday. And we've also got a special two-hour long Christmas racing special with all your tips for the festive period. We'll be joined by Joseph O'Brien, Ony O'Connor, Barry Garrity, Henry de Bromhead and Patrick Mullins. That's us done for tonight. Tom Dunn is up next. Good luck. Get my ball and the out of grass. Christmas jumpers, yes or no? No. 